must be obvious that Muhammad Ali was the biggest single experience and clearly the most important influence in whatever work I've done as a sports writer. Because I'm the champion. I'm the real champion. There'll never be one like me. And all of you people in Britain who rank me as the greatest, I'm going to prove I'm the greatest. I'm going to prove to you I'm the greatest. We're going to prove to the world I'm the greatest. This is my last fight. I don't want none of you to miss it. I'm going to eat some raw meat and I'm going to train. I'm going to get ready and chop some more trees. He would feel great going into the ring. A lot of fighters feel great coming out when they've got the job done. Now, I understand he wants to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and with me trade blow for blow. But if he's hip, he will take a dip because I plan to bust his lip. And after the fight, he will know he was in a scuffle because he couldn't master the Ali shuffle. We should have known that Muhammad Ali would not settle for any ordinary old resurrection. His had to have an additional flourish. So, having rolled away the rock, he hit George Foreman on the head with it. It was by far the greatest privilege I've ever had as a reporter. I don't consider a minute of the time I devoted to covering Muhammad wasted. Everybody stop talking now, attention. Never again defeat me. Never again say that I'm going to be defeated. Never again that make me the underdog until I'm about 50 years old. Right. Then you might get me. I told you I'm the real champion. I told you I'm the champion of the world. Nowhere, not in Kuala Lumpur or Manila, beside the log cabin mosque at his camp on a Pennsylvania mountain, or by the turgid sweep of the Zaire River, has Muhammad Ali ever contrived a less likely or less forgettable setting for the utterance of his dreams? The fight goes like this. Ding! Ali comes out to meet Frazier, but Frazier starts to retreat. If Frazier goes back an inch farther, he'll wind up in a rain sad seat. Ali swings to the left. Ali swings to the right. Look at the kid carry the fight. Frazier keeps backing, but there's not enough room. It's a matter of time. There Ali lowers the boom. Now Ali lands to the right. What a beautiful swing. And the punch lifts Frazier clean out of the rain. <laughs> out of wrestle with an alligator. That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I done tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning, throw thunder in jail. That's bad. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. I reckon that it's indisputable that uh, he's the most extraordinary phenomenon in the entire history of organized sport. You would be hard-pressed to name any sportsman during the second half of the 20th century who made the impression on the world that Muhammad Ali did. Hugh McIlvanny was ringside for what he described as the fight of the century against Joe Frazier in 1971, and then the rumble in the jungle with George Foreman three years later. He had what he describes as the privilege of getting to know Ali away from the ring. How early on did you become aware that Muhammad Ali was going to become something very special? Before I'm ever met him, I had read a lot about him and it was impossible to avoid the realization that this was a remarkable phenomenon. But a lot of the stuff that was written was along the lines of Gassius, Cassius, the Louisville, also some of it was tainted with a real resentment of him because it came out of the US and there was a very strong feeling against him that he was, not only was he an uppity black man, but he was refusing to answer the call to the nation's colours and so on. This was by the time he did refuse to be drafted. When that uh, intensified, you could see in it the deep antipathy that had been there all along because he had too much to say for himself in the, in the eyes of uh, a lot of white people in America, a lot of redneck people particularly. I felt when he came to London for the first time to fight Cooper, the great Henry Cooper, in 1963. I made up my mind that there must be a lot more interesting uh, material around this man. Uh, there must be more to him than Gassius Cassius. Working for a Sunday paper, which was always the fundamental advantage that I had, that I had time to hang around uh, any individual I wanted to cover, I 
I didn't have to mm. go in for quick hits and then rush back to file. Because of that advantage, I was able to pursue Muhammad the first. Well, he was Cassius then, of course. He was Cassius Clay. On his very first trip, I, I got quite close to him. I, I found myself able to get back and have an interview with him in his hotel room. Straight away, I realised that uh, this was probably going to be a major theme in any reporting work I was doing. I decided that I didn't want to be too far away from him whenever there was an opportunity to be close. As a member of that press corps, what was the secret of getting to know Ali gaining his trust so that you could come away with such good stories about him? I think it was mainly the process of exploiting advantages, having, of course, the desire to get him on his own when he was likely to have these moments of uh, fascinating reverie. If you went towards Muhammad Ali with this sort of clipboard approach, there was no chance of getting anything very much. Before he fought Henry Cooper the, the second time, an inspired journalist, a you know, man who was the deputy editor of The Observer called Michael Davy, said to me, do you think if he went over, you see, he was going to come to London. So everybody assumes he's coming to London about a couple of weeks before the fight. And everybody says, well, we'll get plenty of them there. But Michael Davy had the sensible idea of uh, preempting that, going the, over there and getting him before he got on the plane. He said to me, do you think if you went over there, you'd get Mohammed was in, in Miami with Angela Dundee? I said, I think so. I, I said, I'll phone Angela. And I phoned Angela Dundee. And Angelo, of course, uh, you know, he's, he was originally from Philadelphia, Angelo, and he was one of my favourite men in the business, and uh, he, he was very sharp. But, of course, his attitude to these things was, uh, was pretty straightforward. He said, yeah, I said, are you there? Because I was worried at that time he'd got involved with the Nation of Islam. Muhammad was likely to fly up to Chicago to see Elijah Muhammad, and I thought I might miss him. So I said uh, to Angelo, is he there? He said, we're all here, I'm here, the kid's here, come on over, you know, as if you're walking across the street. But I went over and I had a week with him, just moving around with him. He had two cars at the time, a black Cadillac and a white Cadillac. He said, I ain't integrated, but my cars is integrated. He didn't have either of the cars. These black Muslim guys were all wheeling about. I was going around with Mohammed on taxis. When we were flying back, I flew back with him, and Angelo you know, said, I'll get us upgraded. And he got us upgraded from Miami to New York. But then we couldn't get upgraded for the long haul. Angela was raging about this. But Mohammed, of course, was in first class. Mohammed, uh, Angela said, well, the big guy needs the room. He said, we'll be all right. He got the airline people to give us about three or four seats each, enough room to lie down. And actually, halfway through the flight, Mohammed came back out of first class and said to me, you want to go up there? He said, uh, I want to stretch out for a while. So he lay out on, on my seats, and I went up and sat in first class in, in his seat. But then when we arrived in London, there was an amazing scene because there was a little guy in first class who'd obviously been too enthusiastic about the free drink, and he was absolutely out of the business. We stopped at Shannon, and they were almost not, we got off the plane for a well, and it, they weren't going to let this wee guy up back on the plane, but they let him on. And then when we got to London, of course there was a great posse of press men and photographers waiting for us in the tarmac, and people on the plane were arranging it so that Mohammed would come down the stairs, but they were getting rid of some people beforehand. And when the wee man got to the top of the stairs, he thought the reception was for him, and he started sort of trying to hold forward. They got him huckled out of the way, and then Mohammed came off. A few of my friends were in that group waiting, and when they saw me get off the plane, they went, ah, oh, give us a break, you know, because this was a Saturday before the stuff came out. On the Sunday, they didn't know I was over there. And when I came down the stairs of the plane, it's not often, I'm not I'm not being smart about that, it's not often I could, uh, I could uh, give them a wee superior glance, but I gave it to them that day. So much of Ali was about performance people saw a performer outside the ring but when you got one-to-one -one with them back in america when you were driving around with them when you were in the gym did you feel that the performance left it never really stopped but it had a different uh, a different pitch and a different tone it was much 
much more intriguing, much more amusing, because there was a kind of repetitive quality about it. It was very funny, a lot of the other stuff. The, the thing about Muhammad is, in spite of the vast gaps in his education and so on, he could be amazingly naive about many things. He was not only a man with a remarkable mind of a certain kind, but real wit at times. It wasn't just that, you know, a lot of that ranting thing, it was funny up to a point you went, oh, give us a break. But at times it could be really quite witty. Like, there was one occasion when there was a great kind of turmoil going on around a press conference, mainly involving the press men, you know, there was some great scuffle and argument going on, and he got hold of the microphone, and all he said was, this is the greatest speaking, <laughs> you know, and the whole hubbub <laughs> subsided then. Talking about his naivety, I remember on the trip to Miami, or when I was going around the cab with him, one of the big sparring partners was in the cab with us. And we passed the cinema, and there was a film on about the mafia. Mama said, Mafia, what's that? And <laughs> the big guy said, That's the mafia. That's them guys with the typewriters. <laughs> it wasn't the, the teenage boy out of Louisville at that time. Either. When you're talking about getting close to him, there was a, there was a great Italian journalist, a woman called Oriana Falacci who came to see him in the gym, the Fifth Street gym in Miami, which was a wonderful place for me to, to, to hang around. I just, you know, it was a real American gym, and Angelo was there in control of it. Oriana Falazzi came in, literally with her clipboard, uh, looking for an interview with Mohammed, and she'd arranged it through Angelo, through the Italian connection. She had all these prepared questions. I had been hang around with him, out to this little house he was in, a lot of children around so, and that's what she was complaining about to Dundee, she said, Angelo, this is no good, I keep trying to ask him questions, and children are crawling all over him all the time, you know, that kind of thing would suit most of us, but if you went to him with, uh, as I say with a list of questions you would just get the turn, well you always got the turn up to a point but it was far more interesting I remember on another occasion he drove my great friend uh, Chris Smith and great ally and colleague. We went to see him in Chicago for a magazine piece. And when we turned up, <laughs> the first thing he said was, what are you doing here? I didn't give you permission to leave London. <laughs> and I said, well, we just took a chance. And anyway, it, we got in his car with him. It was an open-top Rolls Royce, and we drove around Chicago with him. And, and then he switched over, and he got a guy who was driving him. He started talking about things. He was saying, uh, do you think if I ran against Nixon, I would beat him? <laughs> you know, this. this relationship that you had with Muhammad Ali must have been a great help to you when it came to March 1971 and what was labelled the fight of the century. Joe Frazier against Muhammad Ali. That is so. Before I... I must emphasise, by the way, when, when you say oh, how close you are with Muhammad, it's very peculiar. He would never have known my name, whereas he would know the names of television people, for example, because that was practice, that if you were on television, you know, he would know Harry Carpenter's name, he would know Red Guthridge's name, he wouldn't know my name. When he saw me, he would say, ah, my man, the writer from London, you know, and that was, that was about the size of it. He wouldn't have had an inkling of my name, although, you know, I'm not saying this as a claim, it's just a fact because of the advantages of time that I've been emphasising all, all along that uh, I would think I spent more hours alone with him than, than any other journalist from this country. But that doesn't mean that, uh, as I say, there was the kind of personalised connection that involved first names. But that fight in 1971, I say, the fight of the century. From the journalistic point of view, it was another example of the advantages you can get if you just... Uh, make an early move or if if you uh, come in from an angle. Chris Smith and I went down to Miami. He was coming to New York, but we went down to Miami where he was training and had a week down there. And every morning we had him to ourselves, you know. The New York press came down for one day. It's the way the, the Americans tend, often tend to cover these events. They flew down, went in from the airport, 
watch them work in the gym, gathered round at a wee press conference, went back to the airport and went back to New York. Well, that was fine, and that's what the, the guys needed for their work. But what we did was we were we were booked in there for a week, and every morning there was a little golf course called the Bayshore Golf Course, and that's where he did what was laughingly called his road work because he wasn't the keenest man on the roads. And he was running around uh, a little guy from Chicago who was uh, the bodyguard, Reggie, Reggie Thomas. Reggie was inclined to be dressed in one colour from head to toe. It might be purple or mauve, you know, including a, one of these big kind of scone caps on. And Reggie was serious business, you know. Reggie had been sent down from Chicago to be the bodyguard and uh, everybody knew. I'd, I'd had an, uh, an occasion when I was involved in one of the rough quarters of Miami when, when Mohammed was doing his, um, his publicity for this fight. But Lancaster was involved in the sort of backing for that fight and he appeared he was in he was down near in the what could be called the ghetto there were some people around there and one of the guys with us was a big wrestler called Smokey the Bear and when a bad scene developed a fellow appeared out of the locals called Nicodemus with a kind of band around his head and he started sparring with Muhammad in the street and he got a wee bit rowdy and the way back Smokey the Bear said, I wasn't worried. You know, this is this huge man, the wrestler. He said, I wasn't worried. He said, Reggie was there. <laughs> you know, this little man. But when we were doing this, or Mohammed was doing this, running around the Bayshore golf course, Reggie was following in, in the Cadillac, slow speed. He could afford to be fairly slow when Mohammed was running. A little dog ran out, you know, yapping. And... Uh, Reggie tried to run it over, you know. It was interfering with her work. And my mom said, hey, Reggie, no, Reggie, no. He just a bluff dog, Reggie. <laughs> there were all these things. And then my mom started explaining the philosophy of of the nation of Islam, all about the mothership and about, oh, you know, circling the earth and how they, they would drop bombs that were jackhammer bombs that would burrow into the earth and then blow up. Even these days when I meet up with my great friend Chris Smith, we find ourselves falling off the chair when we start talking about that stuff. When it came to the fight itself at Madison Square Gardens, what was it like being ringside watching these two gladiators come out their corners for what everybody it was such an anticipated fight it was, it was a world event it was a, it was a huge fight that was as big a fight as as any of them they can talk about you know Mayweather Pacquiao and so on well they, all they're talking about are zeros they're saying the, the money's bigger so it's bigger no it's not <laughs> don't be ridiculous you know that was a far bigger fight the rumble in the jungle was a far bigger fight but they just think it's money how can you say it's not bigger? Well, I'll say it. The clamour, of course, to get into that fight by... I mean, the same would apply to the Parkhill, mind you. Media applications were fairly numerous, to say the least. Probably the most famous sports writer of his time was a man called Peter Wilson, who wrote for the Mirror. He was a man who a, wore a Inverness cape and carried a silver top cane and so on. And when we were all told to put baseball caps on to go into the media section, Peter didn't think that was quite appropriate to his usual notions of dress. So he said, why do we have to wear these ridiculous things? And ex-Condon John Xavier Condon, who was the Madison Square Garden press officer, gave him a fairly succinct explanation. He said, so the cops will know which skulls to crack and which to leave alone. Even Peter had to accede to the logic of that. But the demand for tickets was such that even somebody as famous as Frank Sinatra was oh, yeah. struggling to get a seat. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, he, he tried to uh, infiltrate the press section and John Condon made it clear to him that that didn't really make sense. Uh, I mean, Condon was another of those New York figures that I uh, I enjoyed very much. I, I, I liked being around those people, uh, you know, because they were intelligent. It's not, uh, it's not that I'm celebrating uh, hard-nosed New York behaviour and, uh, you know, sort of boorish aggression. That's not what it was. They were very smart people. Uh, the other important point about 
the first Ali Fraser is, the hostility to Muhammad was still extreme at that time. Even in the press, sees calling out, you know, yeah, his, his time has come, tear his head off, Joe, and all this kind of stuff. The piece I wrote after that fight, I mean, Fraser won the fight. You see, Muhammad had only been back uh, about four months. He'd been out for about three and a half years. Then he fought Quarry, uh, and he's come back fighting. Then he fought Oscar Bonavena. And then, within about five months, probably, he's fighting Joe Fraser. It was unreal. But, of course, the big knockdown, and it was some knockdown, it had several effects that it made it clear that it would be ludicrous to think anybody other than Fraser won the fight. But... It also showed you the powers of recovery of Muhammad because when I left to hit him, he was up at two. Okay, he wasn't quite right, but he got older, Joe, and wrestled his way around. You know, when you talk about the, the great fights of, of Ali's career, people leave out quite a few of the major considerations. One of them is the effect of the exile. Muhammad's best years were before they put him out of the game uh, because of his refusal to be drafted. When he came back in 1970, he was reduced. Just before that, the level of performance was extraordinary. There was one fight where he beat Cleveland Williams, who was a pretty good heavyweight. He was punching with the speed of a middleweight or a welterweight, and the accuracy was extraordinary, and his feet were tremendous. When he came back, he, was still, he still had a lot of great qualities, as we know, because he, he, won, the, he won the title a couple of times. But... He wasn't nearly as great a fighter. The judgment of some of the, the great fights is uh, a wee bit questionable at times. For instance, the, the second fight with, with Fraser, most people accept that it was a pretty ordinary fight. Muhammad won it quite, I saw all those three fights. Muhammad won, uh, won the second one quite easily, but wasn't he? Now, the, the third one in Manila, the thrill in Manila, people talk about it, greatest fight, heavyweight fight in history. A lot of nonsense. What it was was an exercise in brutality and endurance. Both of them were markedly past their best by then. It was actually almost horrifying, that fight. It was so brutal. And in the end, one of the great men of boxing, Eddie Futch. Angelo was a great corner man, but Eddie was probably the greatest boxing trainer that I've ever come across. He cut the gloves off Joe and wouldn't let him come out eventually and put an end to it. The other Ali fight everybody talks about, of course, is Zaire, 1974, the rumble in the jungle against George Foreman. Zaire, although it happened late for Muhammad, did have many of the characteristics of a great fight, one of which, for me anyway, is fluctuation. There are many people who say, ah, oh, I... I had a good idea beforehand. I tipped him and all. Well, if you did, you'll go to the poor house if you, if you keep tipping on that basis because George Foreman's eight previous fights had all ended within two rounds. He was a, a man slaughtering the opposition. And the victims weren't uh, nobodies. Two of those victories were against Joe Frazier, who always gave Muhammad as much as he wanted, and Ken Norton, who, you know was a nightmare opponent for Muhammad in Zaire. I mean, everything about it was surreal, of course. It happened in the middle of an African night. As I've pointed out more than once, I knew I wasn't at the average boxing match when a big woman in the ringside seats was breastfeeding her baby. Then you look around the ring and you see uh, Mailer and Plimpton sitting together. Um, Miller wrote a very good book called The Fight about it afterwards. I was a great admirer of much of Norman Miller's writing and much of his writing about boxing, but I never considered him one of the great judges. And as for George Plimpton, again, a man of great distinction, but I think he did much better work as the editor of the Paris Review than he did as a ringside <laughs> aficionado. I heard him afterwards saying that at one point in the fight, I think maybe around the third or the fifth rounds, when uh, George had Mohammed pinned in the ropes, he said, I, I turned to Norman and said, the fix is in. The fix! I mean, anything less orchestrated or arranged would be hard to imagine. At that point, I was watching the action through my fingers because, obviously, my heart was with Mohammed, and I thought, this could end terribly. 
But of course, as I found out afterwards, when talking to him, uh, he was a lot less concerned than the rest of us. He used to say, you know, when you see uh, what you think is trouble for me in the ring, he said, you know, that's how you see it. He said, I'm like a pilot who's uh, got a lot of hours flying. He said, I fly through a storm. I know what's happening. He said, you don't. You're back in the passenger seat, you know. I said, yeah, okay. We should have known that Muhammad Ali would not settle for any ordinary old resurrection. His had to have an additional flourish. So, having rolled away the rock, he hit George Foreman on the head with it. Foreman, roughly disabused of his conviction that all his rivals were entombed in physical inferiority, is by no means the only one left stunned by the blow, and that gives Ali a particular satisfaction. He said so more than once in that muted time early on Wednesday afternoon when the turmoil detonated by his achievement had subsided for a few hours. Lying back on the thick cushions of an armchair in his villa with the windows curtained against an angry sun that was threatening to evaporate the Zaire River as it slid like a grassy ocean past his front door, he talked with the quiet contentment of a man whose thoughts were acting on him as comfortingly as the hands of a good masseur. I kicked a lot of asses, not only George's, he said. All those writers who said I was washed up, all those people who thought I had nothing left to offer but my mouth, all them that been against me from the start and waiting for me to get the biggest beating of all times. They thought big bad George Foreman, the baddest man alive, could do it for them, but they know better now. The rumble of the jungle's gone down in boxing folklore, but so has the way that you pursued Muhammad Ali in the hours after the fight. I'll never tire of stressing that it's just about the kind of opportunities you have because you work for a Sunday paper, you've got to take them and you've got to have a way of working out how you might get maximum benefit from them. And Ken Jones and I were together after the fight. I said to, to Ken, I said, the one certainty is that the big man won't be able to sleep after this. And we had been lodged out at Insella a government complex about 40 miles from Kinshasa, whereas a lot of the journalists were in the city, and they felt they'd got a bit of an advantage there, but I didn't think so, because Mohammed had a villa out at Insella, and we were handy for that. But anyway, I said to Ken, let's go and wait in the polite ambush for him outside his, his villa, and hope that he comes. And for a while I thought I'd better lose her, because... We were there about an hour and a half, and nothing and I said, oh, I wasn't as smart as I thought, maybe this is a stumor. But then he just came stomping across this little patch of lawn behind the villa. He said, you guys want to talk to me? I said, yeah, that was the idea. He said, come on in. And we went into the villa, and there were only ladies who were cooking for him. His, his uh, father's sister, Coretta Clay, and a woman called Lana Chabaz, and his bodyguard. Ken and myself, and we had two and a half hours with him. It was by far the greatest privilege I've ever had as a reporter. You know, this is the same day. This is just a few hours after the rumble in the jungle. He went through everything, and he exposed, to my mind anyway, a lot of the claptrap that had been uttered about, you know, that would be uttered subsequently about uh, the rope-a-dope you know, a lot of people said, ah, oh, he had worked it all out in advance and so on. I mean, he said, the trick was to make him think he was the baddest man in the world and everybody had to run from him. Truth is, I could have killed myself dancing against him. He's too big for me to keep moving around him. I was a bit winded after doing it in the first round, so I said to myself, let me go to the ropes while I'm fresh, while I can handle him there without getting hurt. Let him burn himself out. Let him blast his ass off and pray he keeps throwing. Let it be a matter of who can hit who first, and that's me. This was a real scientific fight, a real thinking fight. For me, it was. Everything I did had a purpose. You mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of the times it was a performance when you spoke to Ali. But in those two and a half hours that you had with him in his villa after the Foreman fight, 
he must have physically, mentally been exhausted. Did you feel he was still performing, or were you getting closer to the real Ali? Well, when point? I say performing, I mean it's, it's a true rendering of what's in his mind and what's, what he's feeling at the time. The thespian aspect of his personality was never totally obliterated. During that spell we had with him in his villa, an American television show called Wide World of Sports, and Jimmy Brown, the former great American football player was uh, the lead figure in this program and Mohammed kept arguing with what was being said on the screen. You know, that's the kind of thing he would always do. You know, they'd say something and he'd say, uh, no I didn't and three or four of the last opponents had to go to hospital or something. He said, yeah, I put him in the bed. And, they, and then there was a scene where Dick Sadler, one of the uh, trainers with George, this is preview stuff, the scene of him holding the heavy bag, George was punching it and knocking Dick Sadler away and my mom said, trouble is, ain't nobody holding me. <laughs> You know, there was all that exchange with the telly. You know, naturally, when you're with somebody in those circumstances, you're studying how they looked and so on. He had a kind of racking cough, and he was holding a rib. He had one sore rib. It was a cold that had been bothering him beforehand, but he had kind of kept it in check. Tiny, tiny markings around the eyes, very, very little. He was being quiet and sincere about what he was saying about the fight and so on, but at the same time it was all shot through with the usual fantastic claims about the effects of this victory, but I'll still be the humble guy, I'll be back in the ghetto kissing black babies. He was uh, painting all these pictures all over, but then he'd return to what had happened in the, in the fight. What about you as a journalist? You must, your shorthand must have been going at some speed to take down everything that you were seeing. You're filling a notebook. What's going through your head as he's coming away with all this and you're with him in his villa? Well, what you're doing most of the time is saying, don't let this stop. You're saying, just keep going, big man. You know, And in fact, he didn't get to the point. I thought he'd get to the point and say, right, that's enough. On your way. But he didn't. You'd almost got to say, OK, Mohammed, do you think we could go now? <laughs> it was miraculous and then when we stepped out into this fierce sun by the Zaire River I said to my pal Ken I said uh, do you think we've got a piece <laughs> what you think immediately is god I hope I don't screw this up you know there's so much good stuff there the same little double act of Jones and McIlvania in New Orleans when he when he reclaimed the title you know he had he had lost the title to Leon Spinks. Mohammed had moved from his Hilton Hotel suite to a little rented house out in the suburbs in a street called Topaz to get away from the clamour and to do his running there. We got that one through our connections with some of the kind of hangers-on. We were hangers-on of the hangers-on, if you like. There was a big guy called Gene Kilroy, who was one of the few white men around there, and he had been involved with you know, sort of PR and football and things like that. I think the Philadelphia Eagles, I think it was. We were pally with him, and he alerted us to this fact that Mohammed was doing the removal uh, to Topaz. When you go there, you don't know what you're going to get, but then what we got was absolutely priceless. Nowhere, not in Kuala Lumpur or Manila, beside the log cabin mosque at his camp on a Pennsylvania mountain, or by the turgid sweep of the Zaire River, has Muhammad Ali ever contrived a less likely or less forgettable setting for the utterance of his dreams? He was lying naked under the stars, stretched on a quilt that was laid out behind the low hedge that screens the brick-floored patio from a patch of neat lawn at number 463 on a street called Topaz in a middle-class suburb of New Orleans. It was shortly after five o'clock on Thursday morning, and he had just run for 30 minutes through the heavy Louisiana night, pounding out three or four miles along the shores of a nearby lake as part of the unwontedly rigorous training schedule he has imposed on himself in preparation for what the T-shirts of the faithful are hailing as the third coming. His attempt on Friday night to win his return match with Leon Spinks and so become the first man ever 
to reign three times as the heavyweight champion of the world. Mohammed loved to talk. If he thought you were interested, that, that's the other thing. When, when you, you say to me, you know, how did you get this access? It would be dishonest to suggest it was hard to get the initial access. It's whether you could turn it into worthwhile exposure to him. I think a lot of people possibly neglected that part of it. They just settled for, oh, we've got that, we've got a few lines from him. And I loved some of these scenes that you found yourself in with him. Some regard him as the, the greatest sportsman of the 20th century. Others have said he's the greatest personality of the 20th century. Where do you fit him well, into, into the world? I think he's the greatest sports figure in the history of organised sport. Do you know, I think for impact, he once said to me, I think I may have the most populist face in the world. I thought the misuse of the word populist was very significant because when you looked at him sometimes, you saw different people. I was inclined once to say that he dreamed himself anew each morning. And I think that was the great romantic scope of uh, Muhammad's personality as a competitor is that it was almost like what we've read about the medieval tradition of vaunting in the mead hall where somebody made a vow and then he was impaled upon it. He had to fulfill it. I think Muhammad almost did that to himself. He was not only fearless, you know, he would feel great going into the ring. A lot of fighters feel great coming out when they've got the job done. You know, Custom Matter's great line to Mike Tyson was you've got to make fear your ally. And that works with a hell of a lot of sportsmen and it is a legitimate approach. But I don't think it was even like that with Mohammed. I think Angelo wasn't far wrong when he said, you know, he thinks every performance is going to be an Oscar winning one. He embraces it with enthusiasm. Towards the end of his fighting career, having enjoyed so many of the good moments with them around the world. How painful was it to have to write of his demise within the ring? Well, that's the kind of pain that you experience with a lot of sportsmen, because uh, very few get out at the right time, and certainly in boxing, that's uh, especially true. Rocky Marciano managed to stop when he had gone 49 and won all of them, was an unbeaten heavyweight champion. Most fighters find that the roof falls in on them one bad night. I believed with Muhammad that his own uh, commitment to how out of the ordinary he was, the sense that he was the greatest, that that was bound to carry the hazard that uh, he would go on too long. But when it did happen, it was nevertheless uh, pretty much an agony for those who were devoted to the dream that he had lived. When the end became inescapable in the Bahamas when he lost to Trevor Berbick, it was uh, particularly horrifying to find that there were still people around him, including his wife at that time. And I remember being in the little clamorous dressing room after that loss. John Travolta, the actor, was there and they were kneeling beside him and they were filling his ears. Maybe it, it could be said they were trying to console him, but that wasn't the feeling I had. They were saying, ah, oh, you actually won the fight and God won the fight. He, he wasn't at the sports. They were also saying, oh, you'll come back and that would have been uh, the most dreadful development had he come back but he didn't by then of course the beginnings of the horror that has unfolded in relation to his health were already conspicuous the notion that it was something that would have happened had he not been a fighter has been not only denied but convincingly refuted by some of the specialists who diagnosed his condition. Can you just sum up, Hugh, the influence that Muhammad Ali had on you? It must be obvious that Muhammad Ali was the biggest single 
experience and clearly the most important influence in whatever work I've done as a sports writer. I reckon that it's indisputable that uh, he's the most extraordinary phenomenon in the entire history of organized sport and certainly the one who reached more people on the planet than anybody else. I did think the moment I encountered him, I was unlikely to be meeting up with anybody who would be more interesting, but I didn't quite appreciate just how much time I'd spent pursuing uh, his remarkable deeds and his even more remarkable nature. I don't consider a minute of the, the time I devoted to covering Muhammad wasted. I did find two, of course, when the twilight closed in upon him and the dancing feet were stilled and that unique voice was silenced. The pain for many around the globe would be severe and it certainly was and and it remains severe for me. and you're listening to a sports podcast from the BBC. For full terms and conditions, go to the website bbc.co.uk slash sportscotland. Today's podcast is taken from the Sports Sound programme of Friday the 3rd of June. We heard about Andy Murray reaching the final of the French Open tennis and from the Scotland football boss Gordon Strachan. Well, this afternoon, Andy Murray beat uh, the defending champion Varinka to reach the uh, final of the French Open tennis this coming Sunday Cardin Itzan was watching on and Cardin, well, a bit of history Andy's reached semi-finals but he's never got to this final before. He has now reached the final of all four of the Grand Slams, of course he has won two of them, Wimbledon and the US Open, but no British man since Bunny Austin in 1937 had reached the final here at Roland Garros, until just about an hour and a half or so ago when after a, a terrific match two hours and 35 minutes of really high class, high standard tennis Andy Murray took that fourth set against Stan Wawrinka at 6-2 to seal his first ever place in this uh, Roland Garros showpiece really um, quite amazing. Watching some of the pictures this afternoon, I mean he raced into a two set lead and then Wawrinka managed to claw a set back after that and you were wondering, oh no, hope Andy's not going to fold, but he did the job fairly straightforward in the end, did he not? Well this is is a defending champion. Uh, he's uh, it's a losing defence of his title, of course, because he is now out of the tournament. Stan Wawrinka, but this is a guy who obviously plays fabulously well here. Otherwise, he wouldn't have won the title in the first place. Had kind of uh, strolled pretty much through the tournament, playing some quite good stuff, but just starting to, to get good and played a really high level of tennis today. The first set in particular was uh, was tight, 55 minutes, a one break of serve, and when Andy Murray won that, you just thought, yeah, it's going to be his day. He managed to get the second set more comfortably a couple of breaks of serve but you know Vavrinka wouldn't have been the champion here if he wasn't a good player and you know good players fight back good players don't want to lose in straight sets he took that third set when Andy Murray was serving at 4-5 to try and stay in the third set he couldn't but first thing Murray did was to break the Vavrinka serve in the very next game and then after that I think uh, you know a, a, a big weight had been lifted from the Scottish shoulders because he relaxed into that fourth set played some really nice tennis once again and everything that Vavrinka threw at him Murray just returned turned out with more. Now, almost inevitably, it's Novak Djokovic, his nemesis, that he's going to meet in the final. But I think what's interesting 
interesting here is that uh, this is one grand slam that Djokovic has never won on clay in Paris. He hasn't got there yet. Yes, absolutely. You may remember the fantastic five-set semi-final that they played here over a couple of days last year and Djokovic came out there on top on the, on the Saturday uh, after they had to come back and finish the match. And it is the one tournament, obviously, now that Novak Djokovic wants more than anything else. It's the one thing missing from his trophy cabinet. He has, of course, the other three titles already. He is the defending champion from Australia, from New York, from Wimbledon. So this would be the Novak Slam. If he wins on Sunday, he holds all four of the tennis majors. What a phenomenal achievement that would be. And if he wins on Sunday again, he will have completed the career Grand Slam. Again, there are not too many men in the history of tennis who have managed to do that. So, yes, history on the line for Novak Djokovic. But, well, goodness me, if Andy Murray thinks that there's you know, any kind of payback or karma, having lost agonisingly to Djokovic so many times in Australia, um, what would be the match that he would want to win? It would be here in Paris at Roland Garros, the one match that Novak Djokovic is desperate to win. Will it be frustration for him once again, this time at the hands of Andy Murray? We shall see, or we shall hear on Sunday, because Cardin's going to bring us commentary. Finally, Cardin, just before you go, great news from the wheelchair tennis at Gordon Reid from Helensbra. Uh, he's into two finals. It's going to be a busy weekend. Once again, it's Australia all over again when you had you know Andy and, and Jamie Murray in finals and then Gordon Reid as well. Well, in, in finals, it's, uh, it's, it's great stuff. Yes, Gordon Reid will be in the final of both the wheelchair singles. He is, of course, the uh, Australian Open champion, and he'll also have a chance to defend his French Open doubles title with Shingo Kaneda of Japan. Both those matches are coming tomorrow. Just a little warm-up then, if you will, for Andy Murray against Novak Djokovic on Sunday. Well, Kerdin, busy weekend coming up, and Kerdin are bringing us commentary of Sunday's final here on Sunday's Sports Sign. We, we're on it at 12. The tennis starts at uh, around about 2 o'clock and we've got uh, plenty before that on the build-up to the big match. So uh, join us on Radio Scotland on Sunday at midday for the final of the French Open Tennis with Andy Murray up against Novak Djokovic. Just a reminder, this is Friday Sports Sign with Jeff Webster. The time's approaching what, uh, 7 minutes to 7. Commentary coming up from the Falkirk Stadium on Scotland's Women against Iceland in that Euro qual qualifier. But of course, uh, the Scottish football season comes to an end tomorrow night when the Scotland team take on France in a friendly in Metz. France, of course, about to host the European Championships and they're considered the favourites for the tournament. Scotland will be hoping for better than last weekend's 1-0 defeat to Italy in Malta. We've got commentary on the game here on BBC Radio Scotland Medium Wave and on digital. And the Scotland boss, Gordon Strachan, has been speaking to our match commentator, Liam McLeod, who asked him how well prepared they were for the match. What you can be ready for sometimes is pure brilliance. Pies, free kicks, well, you can prepare for that, actually, but... The individual brilliance, like Pogba's cross the other day, there was uh, for Giroud's goal was just phenomenal. Um, so we, we we know their shape, but what the players do within that shape, uh, some there's real brilliance at times, and that's what we'd like to produce in, in, in years to come. People know their shape, but they can't deal with the players that we've got. And that's still the secret of being a good side, is being able to produce good players. Didier Deschamps has got the, the luxury of having a superstar pretty much for every position, if not two. Uh, is this a side you feel justifiably are favourites to win the, the tournament this summer? I can see why people say that. Yeah, I can see that. But I can also see why people don't want to play against Italy with their defence. Um, in England, Germany, Belgium with these fantastic players they've got now. But I agree with you that the French are must be the favourites and I don't look at the bookies but I imagine they would be the favourites When you booked the trip to Malta do you feel as though you've got what you wanted out of it? No, I didn't get one or a performance so that's disappointing and what did I get out of it? I got goalkeeper performance was comfortable defenders that played very well I got knowledge the next time that we play against a system like that the players myself coaching staff I got knowledge what, what, what we do um, so we've got all that. We've got some young players, as Stephen and Barry, coming through and, and seeing who who can work with us, who wants to work with us, and who's got to add. We only know that when they actually get big game time. So that's what they're getting here. But I do we all know we need to be at our best on Saturday night. But we're looking forward to the challenge. What can you give me expecting? Uh, a hard-working team against a very talented team, a lot of individuals. Uh, hope the hard work can pay off.
That's Gordon Strachan talking to Liam McLeod there. Well, let's cross to Metz in France and join our reporter, Alistair Lamont. And Alistair, uh, of course, the French is the host, didn't go through qualifying, so they've, uh, they've not really had a competitive game for a couple of years. No, they haven't, Jeff. Uh, that hasn't worked against them in the last two tournaments they've hosted, though they've won them both. So I don't think they'll be too concerned about that. And uh, when you have a look at their personnel, they can call upon uh, just a quick glance at the team that beat Cameroon the other night. Uh, Paul Pogba, Blaise Maturi, Kingsley Coman, Olivier Giroud, Dimitri Payet. Those were just some of the ones who started the match. Uh, I look at their bench and it's just as impressive with Anthony Martial, for instance, uh, and N'Golo Kante. Uh, so, you know, a, a real host of star players, as Liam was uh, alluding to there uh, in the interview with Gordon Strachan. So, uh, you know, they, they, are, uh, they are real candidates to, to win this competition, you would have to say, regardless of the fact uh, they haven't played a competitive match. And uh, obviously their final preparations uh, taking place tomorrow night when they, when they face the might of Scotland. And really, Al, we're looking for much better from Scotland in this game. I and mean, you know, you want to see some shots on target. You want to be the, the passing was what Gordon Strachan was going on about after the Italy game, wasn't it? Absolutely, you know, it really was abject. I have to say, in Malta, one thing it's fair to to mention is that the pitch wasn't great. Uh, it, was, it did look very bumpy, but uh, when you when you say that, you also have to accept that Italy were able to control the ball. They were able to pass the ball to their teammates. Uh, Scotland simply weren't able to do that. Um, as you say, they didn't manage a shot on target. One uh, into the side netting from Matt Ritchie late in the game uh, was their only effort on goal. So, yeah, I mean there's a general acknowledgement around the Scotland camp that they have to be much better than that because let's face it France are a stronger team at the moment than Italy are and I don't think they will have the misfiring forwards that Italy had the other night as well um, Italy if they had won that game 5-0 um, that wouldn't have been uh, overly harsh on Scotland uh, the fact that Italy passed up so many chances let us off the hook uh, uh, and you know the concern is that France wouldn't do that if Scotland were to turn in as poor a performance so Gordon Strachan says you know they've worked, they've spent this week working on what went wrong, he was talking about um, the shape being wrong, uh, people in wrong positions when they won the ball back so they weren't able to, to keep a hold of it for any great length of time, so they say they've worked on that um, we will see tomorrow evening evening uh, in Mets, whether that work uh, will, will you know, bring the kind of performance they're looking for, uh, but it, it has to be said they are up against the top team. And briefly, Alistair, uh, many changes expected in the Scotland team tomorrow night? I think there will be a few changes at least because Gordon Strachan wants to give you know people who have made the trip a, a chance but by the same token he doesn't want to be making wholesale changes necessarily to disrupt um, what he's been working on as I say over the course of the week he can't just throw in you know two or three debutants as well you know, you know Barry Mackay it would be nice to see him play um, but you know in, in the, the theatre that they're going to be playing in in Mets tomorrow against such a strong team he'll want to have his experienced hand so don't be too surprised if the likes of Robert Snodgrass for instance Sean Maloney come in having joined the squad after their uh, playoff victory with Hull so that's the kind of changes you might see I suspect we'll see a pretty experienced Scotland team uh, at least start the match against France we were also at the Falkirk Stadium for coverage of the Euro 2017 qualifier between Scotland's women and Iceland there for us were Craig Patterson and Julie Fleeting Julie, at half time, we thought, well, they might make certain changes. Scotland have got to get back into this. They maybe had too much respect for Iceland in the first half, but uh, three goals in seven minutes absolutely wiped Scotland clean. Yeah, it did, absolutely. Um, we expected Scotland to come out and, and take the game to Iceland, but um, instead it was the other way about. Um, Iceland were getting the ball wide, they were getting quality crosses into the box, um, and, and their finishing was incredible tonight. So they thoroughly deserved the, the 4 nothing. Um, win um, and Scotland will really need to get themselves together, dust themselves down, put in a good performance against Belarus and gather themselves for the away, le or the away game um, in Iceland in September. Craig Patterson, it's, it's a what if, but uh, what if Jane Ross had scored when it was just still 1 0? Because, uh, you know, just a minute or so after that, Iceland got to make it 2 0. Yeah, fine margins, and that was the best piece of play from Scotland all night. Given to Kim Little, lovely threaded ball to Hayley Lauder. She smashed.
smashes it across goal. And Jane Ross, you know, any touch and it's in the back of the net. She slid in, couldn't quite get there. And a minute later, another ball into the box. Scotland don't defend the high ball as they hadn't all evening. And it was in the back of the net. And Iceland, who were comfortable at 1-0, as soon as they went to 2-0, they could relax. They could play their football. They scored another couple of goals. And they just saw things out, needing the penalty at the end. You sometimes wonder, normally you'd put your mortgage on Kim Little firing that into the bottom corner. On a night like this, you thought this might just go wrong as well. You're looking for that as a consolation goal, something to lift the players ahead of the game in Belarus. But Scotland didn't even get that. And, uh, you know, a lot of questions for the coach because, you know, the system they used didn't work. The changes didn't make a great deal of difference. And this was a game where, you know, everybody came along with high expectations that Scotland, you know, would be able to win the game. They certainly wouldn't be transforming them at home. And this has been a major setback. You know, the campaign has gone really well so far. Now the players have got to show that they can bounce back. Huge game against Belarus on Tuesday. They've got to find a way of getting over this quickly, getting back together, pulling together as a team, and going away from home and getting a result and making sure they are at the finals next summer. And Julie, you just had a feeling early on it might not be Scotland's night with that goal that they gave away after 10 minutes. It was such a soft goal from that cross that just evaded everybody. That, that kind of just set the tone for a very disappointing night. Yeah, it did. And we had hoped that it would uh, Scotland would lift their game after that. But instead, um, we've seen Iceland growing in confidence. Um, they were knocking the ball about. They were creating space for each other. They had runners off the ball. Um, and instead, they, it just spurred Iceland on to, to get forward and get more goals. Craig, I suppose one area that Anna Signal has to look at ahead of the Belarus game is the centre of defence. Those crosses that kept coming in, well, there was three-headed goals from three crosses, as well as that first goal. Yeah, you know, certainly any, any manager I have played under would be looking at his goalkeeper and his two centre-backs if you lose four goals for balls coming in from wide areas. Yes, full-backs have got to block crosses as best they can, but it wasn't as if the ball was fizzed in and the players just got half a yard ahead of you and nipped in and scored with a great header. It was just any old cross into the box and Icelandic players just looked hungrier to go and win the ball in the air. You know, and when the first one was, was I mentioned, a defensive disaster. A ball going in and ended up bouncing in the six-yard box and ending up in the back of the net. And it was a problem for Scotland all night and something they're going to have to look at because, you know, Jenny Beatty, if he at the back there, they didn't look comfortable using the, you know, this passing game from the back wasn't working. They didn't look like they could make it work. But I thought at least defensively they'd be strong but when goals go in the way they did three headers more or less inside the width of the goal it wasn't as if they were hit great headers from 8 to 10 yards there were headers in and around an area where your centre backs have got to be dominant they weren't tonight and, and they've got to learn from this because Belarus yes they beat them easily at Motherwell but that was at the game and it was tough you know they were hard to break down it was only when Belarus lost a goal and tried to chase the game and started pushing men forward they actually played into Scotland's hands but at home in front of their own fans I think they'll sit in and they'll be dogged and determined and they will try not to concede and Scotland it took them a long time to wear them down in that first game so this is no gimme you know these players have got to go there and produce a performance and a performance of a high, a much higher standard than they produced tonight I've watched a lot of the Scotland's women's games the last couple of years and it's the first time I've seen virtually every player in the team looking flat this was the big occasion this was the big one this was the one that people are looking forward to and on the night Scotland just failed to produce Julie we tend to look at it from a Scottish perspective but this is a good Icelandic team and I had said beforehand you know they've been averaging just over four goals a game they haven't conceded a single goal and tonight they've not conceded and they've added yet another four yeah, you can see why they've not conceded because they're very, very strong at the back. Um, they're very quick in the wide areas, which matched um, the strength we have in Lisa Evans um, as a winger. The fullback was able to match her for pace the majority of the time. Um, and that kind of takes away that one little trick that we've got. Um, but no, you, you can see what a good side they, they are and why they've been successful over the years. Um, and I think we underestimated, or I certainly did, underestimated the quality that, that they had throughout the entire team. That's it. Thanks for listening. You can keep up to date with all the latest Scottish sports news on BBC Radio Scotland's news bulletins or follow at BBC Sports Sound on Twitter. All the grounds, all the goals, all the news. Sports Sound on BBC Radio.
Radio Scotland. There's no substitute.